the human c- catastrophe starts, of course, with uh, the Ukraine war, uh, uh, where uh, millions of millions of people have been displaced. As you know, there are uh, about four million, or more than four million, uh, ref- uh, four and a half million refugees uh, from Ukraine. There are about seven million people internally displaced within the country. And, uh, and uh, that is a human tragedy of massive proportions. The World Bank president, David Malpass, warned earlier this week that the world faces a human catastrophe. What does this look like? Well, the human c- catastrophe starts, of course, with uh, the Ukraine war, uh, uh, where uh, millions of millions of people have been displaced. As you know, there are uh, about four million, uh, more than four million, uh, ref- uh, four and a half million refugees uh, from Ukraine. There are about seven million people internally displaced within the country. And, uh, and uh, that is a human tragedy of massive proportions. But it doesn't stop there. As you have noticed, there are all the ripple effects in the world, particularly as it pertains to food security. And and many, many countries are dependent on imports uh, uh, from uh, wheat from, for example, Ukraine. Normally, uh, Ukraine feeds about 400 million people in the world. And clearly, that affects particularly the most vulnerable countries. So that is another hit. Then an, another channel where it's hit is that you see that fuel prices have increased enormously. So that uh, affects, of course, always countries that, that can least afford it. And those things are then translated into inflation. And inflation is the worst enemy of poverty. And so what we are going to see is a rise in poverty. And and, and that is, so this is only the Ukrainian dimension. Uh, And then, and and it's fallout. But we are still not out of the the COVID crisis. Nobody talks anymore about it, but it is still there. And it has badly affected it. And then in the fragile countries, we have seen a tragic ways of calamities uh, uh, starting last year from Myanmar over Afghanistan, Yemen, Ethiopia, Mali, Burkina Faso, and ending in uh, in Haiti. So all those things where there are internal conflict, high fragility, takeovers, this is all taxing the poor. So that is the dimension David Malpass was talking about and trying to draw the attention of the world to this. Um, I mean, thank you for that overview, Axel. A, a very sobering picture um, right across the globe. Of course, some of the most vulnerable countries affected, but vulnerable people, even in, in Western um, successful democracy suffering as well. What can be done and what can you at the World Bank do to, to try and alleviate some of this suffering? Well, I think we had a wonderful meeting on Ukraine where uh, President Zelensky attended uh, uh, by video, but uh, in person, the prime minister was there, the finance minister of Ukraine was there, and uh, the international community was uh, rallying around it. And the first thing is that the war has to stop. I mean, that is the very first thing. And I think the message was loud and clear from the, from the spring meetings of a huge call to Russia to stop the war. I think that is the number one. This number two is clearly that everybody needs to be aware that we need to help the most vulnerable countries and the most vulnerable in those uh, uh, countries. And that means that uh, certainly where the World Bank is is providing uh, financial support uh, uh, to these countries. And to this end, uh, the World Bank has announced for the next 15 months, a program up to $170 billion in support and starting with the first 90 days of about $50 billion. So we will be working uh, with countries to see how we can best keep A, their programs on track, and B, particularly deal with the crisis as it is dealing with the fallout, 
not only of the food crisis, but energy crisis. And we have also not diminished our attention to the health crisis. So uh, we have to uh, have a mindset to be active on multiple fronts in dealing with these multiple crises. And when you look at um, how domestic finance ministers and chancellors across the world are grappling with these issues that you've described, the fallout of COVID, um, the inflation, the energy crisis, how do you think they should be handling things on a domestic level? Is it time, for example, um, to be looking at capping energy prices more um, or increasing production from, from certain countries? Are you satisfied that domestic chancellors are doing enough? Well, I think to, to be fair, you know, after an, uh, you know, an awful year with, the, with COVID in, 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 in 2020, there was some uh, hope and, and some rec uh, there was recovery in 2021, but we were also again hit by Delta and COVID, uh, by o Omicron. So you saw the vulnerabilities. Now, over the last six weeks, we are seeing uh, uh, the world has been shell-shocked that, uh, uh, again, uh, you know, war is, is chosen over diplomacy. This is uh, completely unacceptable. And what it is uh, accelerating is to rethink new energy policies. And you see that uh, very actively in Europe, but elsewhere uh, as well. And, and that is also combined, of course, with, uh, with what has been ongoing and an ongoing discussion because of climate change to get more to the renewables. My sense is that there will be uh, uh, an acceleration of this effort that will not be done overnight, but certainly you see in Europe an, uh, an, a determined effort to accelerate uh, the renewable uh, transformation. And my sense is this will also happen in, in other countries as well. Now, let's also not forget when we are dealing in countries like Africa, uh, very often these countries are still needing uh, access to energy. So we need also to keep that perspective that a lot of countries are still struggling even to uh, put light in the houses of families. So that is, uh, is going to be uh, an, a, an important challenge. Maybe from where I'm sitting and our work is, it is, clear that when, uh, when we have crisis, people get very focused on themselves. But we need to keep always in mind that other countries and other people are struggling maybe even more because they are so much poorer and more, so much more vulnerable. So I think this is also a time that we have to show solidarity and to stay engaged with developing countries because they are struggling. And um you mentioned um, COVID earlier. Um, I mean, do you think more needs to be done to still support developing company countries, for example, with the vaccine rollout? So that is absolutely, we have been uh, um, uh, actively supporting uh, countries uh, as a complement to also UN efforts, COVAX efforts, the African Union. Uh, we, we, are, we have been uh, uh, hitting $10 billion in terms of support. And our expectation is that another one, two billion is coming in the next two months uh, uh, in, in terms of vaccine support. I think we will stay on this. Uh, what is also important is that there is an important uh, also emphasis on preparedness for the next one and then ultimately health system strengthening. So where the World Bank is putting a lot of emphasis is, is yes, we need to help uh, uh, continuing the rollout, but we should also take the medium and longer term view that we need to systematically strengthen health systems in developing countries. And to that end, we are not only committed today, tomorrow, but actually for the years, if not for the 10, 20 years to come. This is what is needed, and that will uh, uh, also uh, make these countries more resilient. 
against the next crisis. Yeah, I think that concept of resilience is incredibly important post-pandemic. Um, Axel, I just want to return to the, the topic of inflation. Um, the World Food Bank price index reached an all-time high, rising 11.5% in March. Inflation is so damaging, as you said earlier. What is your fear about how high inflation is going to get? And can anything be done to try and rein inflation in? Well, what you are seeing uh, already in a, in a lot of industrialized countries that uh, there is a uh, change in the policy stance, and particularly by central banks, that they are tightening. Uh, uh, that is uh, most prominently that uh, the uh, central banks are starting to uh, increase interest rates. You see also uh, that some of the um, uh, programs that uh, were done by the European Union, uh, as well as by the US Federal Res uh, Reserves, uh, the purchasing programs are being uh, stopped or faced uh, and started to be phased out. So there's a number of, of, of issues that uh, are, be or are being addressed. What is very clear in for the developing countries, for the poorest, is that we need to look really immediately what is the direct hit on, on the poorest. And there are a certain number of programs that you can help. They're the most prominent are social protection programs that can be very targeted to the most vulnerable. And that uh, we, uh, we are advocated in our dialogue with governments that we need to always look at that so that we can actually make sure that uh, these uh, programs reach the poorest. And that is that can be through social protection programs. We also are still dealing with, of course, the fallout of this uh, COVID crisis and particularly the education crisis. We have been putting a lot of emphasis on this, that uh, a lot a million, tens of millions of kids remain out of school and particularly girls. And so our concern is that we are creating what we call learning poverty, uh, that kids, A, don't go to school and when they are now in school that they don't learn enough. And secondly, particularly, we need to keep uh, focus on girls getting back to school.